Hi everyone, I am very excited to interview our guest, Professor Sigrid Adriansen, Director of Mechanics, Materials and Structures program at Princeton University. She is also the author of the book Cell Structures for Architecture from Finding and Optimization. My name is Sigrid Adriansen. I um, was born and grew up in Belgium. Uh, Belgium is part of the Low Countries, so that is an area that is located uh, mostly below sea level and so the place where I'm from people have always been dealing with um, the interface between um, water and land and this becomes important later in my uh, work. Um, I did my um, high school there and then I went to study at Bath University in the United Kingdom. So I went there when I was uh, 18 years old and I did my bachelor, master and PhD studies there. And uh, Bath University is a very exciting place to study because uh, at that time it was an integrated structural engineering and architecture program. So that means that I had all throughout my undergraduate studies uh, design studios. Often they were uh, together with the architects. Um, I also had the sculpting and painting class that was part of the curriculum. So that made me very interested in design. And then later on when I started doing my PhD studies, uh, I discovered that Bath University act actually has a, a lightweight structures center, so I was very much interested in the structures and the form, so that was a, a great place for me to do my PhD. Um, after I uh, got my PhD, I did a lot of <laughs> different things, but I think the ones that are uh, most um, noteworthy is that I worked for uh, two uh, engineering design consultancies. I worked for Jane Wernick Associates in London and we were mostly doing competition design there. And then um, I also worked uh, for uh, Ney and Partners, that's an engineering design consultancy in uh, Brussels, Belgium. And um, when I was working for Ney and Partners, we got to design um, a, um, a grid shell roof over the courtyard of the Dutch uh, Maritime Museum. And I was very uh, honored because in order to derive the form for that um, bridge uh, roof, we used the algorithms that I had developed during my PhD. So it was very exciting. And then we won this competition and the roof got built. And I was actually very fascinated because um, this is like a grid shell roof and um, it, you know, it's a very beautiful structure, but um, I was thinking this structure is an indeterminate structure. So it's, has a lot of resiliency in it, is, it is curved, so it has stiffness, you know, we use form finding techniques, so it's very slender. And so I got really interested in um, how these curved surfaces can interact with loading and, um, you know, how we could use, maybe use them in other ways and we are currently using them to deal with all the challenges that we are encountering in the 21st century. So, um, of course, in a design consultancy, you cannot really just start researching stuff because there's always other projects to do and you're working on quite short time frames. So then I decided actually maybe um, if I wanted to explore things in more depth then, and you know, I, I was very curious, um, probably an academic position would be better for me. So actually, so I worked for a while in industry and then I applied to academia and you know, eventually became a, a faculty member at Princeton. So the research aspect motivated <coughs> you to become professor and yes. pursue that path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, <coughs> excuse me. Of course, also I'm. I think the wonderful thing about being a, a faculty member is that you are always dealing with young people. <coughs> That's very, um, very, very energizing because I think young people are, of course, the future. But they are very optimistic. They're very bright. They're very enthusiastic. They have so much energy. So that's really wonderful to be working with people like that. So, so one book has to be um, The Tower and the Bridge by uh, Professor David Billington, who also was at Princeton University for whole, his whole career, actually. Um, and um, that book is really amazing because I think it's the first book that really puts into words why some engineering design and construction is really good or is excellent compared to other other things. So he basically developed a jargon to talk about um, really good or excellent such structures. So he talks about um, how really good structures have to be efficient. So um, how you know they have to express how the forces flow through the structure. He talks about how they have to be economic, right? So we don't want to waste either uh, natural resources or economic uh, resources. 
and um, they have to be elegant. Um, and so he was really the first one to put these, he calls it the three E's, put these three E's onto the paper. And, um, you know, although a lot of engineers are, are doing work uh, like that, he was really the first one to express or put these kind of words to it and express why these things are uh, important in the design of structures. And like, what was the age when you read that? Uh, I think I read it, um, so afterwards, you know, I went to work at Princeton University, but I read it, I think maybe when I was 20 or 22, I found hmm. it by accident uh, in a bookshop in my hometown in Antwerp. And so later when I went to, for a job interview at Princeton University, I was like, oh, this <laughs> is the place where the book comes from. This is amazing. Uh, and then afterwards I met Professor Billington. So. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, it was very exciting. Yeah, so actually I have, I have a number of favorite structures, but I will talk about two. Um, both kind of are efficient, elegant, and economic, but um, the two that I want to talk about are two structures that have an incredible spatial quality and it just really make me happy. Uh, the first one is the steel glass grid shell over the courtyard of the British Museum. Uh, this uh, structure, I think, dates from around 2000 um, the engineering was kind of solved by my PhD advisor Chris Williams and I'll talk about him later um, but it's a beautiful structure uh, that has this beautiful pattern pattern spirals uh, going um, in the roof but when you get in have you been there no no uh, when you get into that space it just lifts you up because the spatial quality the lift, lift the light quality is just amazing so that's one the other one is a more recent structure. It's a, a bridge in my hometown, which was done by Yemenian partners. Uh, the bridge is called Spor Nord. And uh, basically it's um, a closed, the whole bridge is like a closed beam, but in the uh, webs, there's a beautiful pattern in there. And again, when you go through that bridge, there is this amazing light coming through. It, it feels really almost like, a, and it really lifts you up. It's just an amazing, it feels a little bit like being in a, a gothic cathedral like with all the light coming in so i yeah i'll leave it by those with those two structures but i think what those two structures have in common is just the incredible spatial and light quality uh, that they have when they when you when you've been in the courtyard or you've gone through the bridge you just feel happier i see mm -hmm. so when you like visit different places do you analyze all the structures based on triple e yeah, kind of. <laughs> Subconsciously, I do, yes. <laughs> I don't know, always know the cost of them, but uh, yeah, I do look at them in that way. And it's, it's a, actually, it's a good way to look at mm -hmm. uh, structures and see uh, yeah, how they perform in that way. But I have a number of people who, for different reasons, have been uh, important to me. But um, I mentioned earlier uh, Dr. Chris Williams at the University of Bath. Uh, he's an incredibly inspiring person because he's very smart. Uh, but he's also very humble, and um, so he was my PhD advisor, and he would always ask questions from a very unexpected angle, and so that kind of taught me to really, when you're working on something, to really question it from very different perspectives, so um, he's really amazing. And then two other people maybe that I want to mention is um, um, Professor Marijke Mola, she's from the uh, Free University of Brussels in Belgium. Um, I got to work with her eventually, but um, it was really her who got me interested in the domain of lightweight structures because when I was 16, I read an article in a Belgian engineering magazine. My father's an engineer, so he got these magazines. And she had written an article about membrane structures, and I, I, I just kept looking at those pictures. I thought they were so beautiful. And so I'm forever grateful to her that she wrote that article. Actually, I mentioned it to her, you know, like 10 years later. I said, yeah, it's because of your article that I wanted to be a structural engineer. Um, so so, so she's, she, she's always been a mentor to me. And then the, the, the third person that I want to uh, mention is um, Jane Wernick. So Jane Wernick, I worked uh, with her at Jane Wernick Associates. Uh, she's uh, an incredible, very talented, very creative um, woman, but she's also very outspoken. So she is very vocal for the things that she believes in and the things um, that she thinks that should be done. And this is not only in the kind of structural engineering field, but also just as, uh, in society. She really stands up and 
you know, for the, for the values that she believes in. And then on top, you know, she ran, she ran this amazing um, design of his uh, mm. by herself. So very, very strong woman. I lead the form finding lab at Princeton University. Uh, this is a research group and we currently have uh, seven people uh, in that group. Um, and we study the mechanics of slender surfaces and how they interact with all kinds of loading. Um, we also develop optimization and form finding techniques. So we develop both analytical, graphical, and numerical methods to study how these structures work. And then we also develop uh, new systems. And these systems are sometimes based or inspired by systems that we see in nature, or systems that we see in history, or systems that we see in arts and crafts. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of what we do in a very, <laughs> in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a very difficult um, question to answer because I have uh, many proud moments, but I can tell, well, I, I think the, the completion of a project is very exciting. Uh, if it gets awards, get, it's very exciting. But um, uh, for me, actually, what makes me most proud is my students. So, uh, and I know that sounds a little bit cliche, but it really makes me very happy when they come back and say, oh, I'm working on this, I'm doing this, and I'm having so much fun. That is really for me, um, yeah, I think my proudest achievements are the things that my students are um, doing. And I always say that to my students, come back and tell me what you're doing. I'm like, yeah, yeah. But it's really, yeah, it, that makes me most proud. I guess on a more kind of um, uh, quantitative way, uh, I, I'm very proud also of an award that I won uh, in 2018. I won at the George AACE George Winter Award, which is an award that um, recognizes um, scholars or practitioners that have done work, not, that are doing excellent engineering work, but also something for society or for human values. And so um, in that particular uh, award, I was uh, kind of recognized for my work on the edge between structures and art and more specifically uh, sculpting. So um, I've been doing that all along my research work, but it was kind of really wonderful to be recognized for that aspect um, of my work by the American Society of Civil Engineers. But I think the, the challenges that I have at the moment is, um, and I think everybody everybody who's in academia is going to this, is uh, obtaining grants and getting your papers uh, published. So. Uh, that is uh, a challenge because that doesn't always immediately automatically happens. Um, but what I've learned is uh, that actually it's really good to get reviews and feedback from peers in the field, whether that's through reviews of your journal papers or reviews of the proposals, because you can really learn a lot and make your work uh, much better uh, when you get uh, reviews. And that's also what I tell my students when they submit papers to journals that you know, this, is a, this should not be like a frightening experience, but it's a wonderful opportunity to get somebody else who's an expert in your domain to look at your work and critically say, hey, what about this? Or have you thought about this? So um, I think I've kind of learned how to enjoy. I mean, I fear the, the <laughs> reviews when they come back, but I also enjoy, you know, like once I go through them, I also enjoy them because often they bring up really good points. And then if you can take that feedback into your work and improve your work, then I, it usually gets much better. So. I think you are very right in saying that when we teach, you know, especially engineering students, we, we usually put a lot of equations on them immediately, or we go to uh, computer coding. Um, but it's very in, uh, important, I think, to develop an intuitive understanding of how um, structures or how structural systems work. And so I think there's a number of ways uh, that, that one can do that. And um, one of them is, um, by making a connection between your physical experience and your mind. So for example, you mentioned the hanging chain models, right? That is, if you have a hanging chain and you let it hang and if it kind of stabilizes and you were to fix it and you turn it upside down, you get an ideal shape for an arch, right? So for form finding specifically, um, you know, indeed there is a lot of computer programs that do form finding, but actually that's not how the um, people who kind of pioneered form finding were doing form finding because computers were just about to get started. So if you think about Fry Otto, you think about Heinz Isler, they were developing physical models and really all, all sometimes even building like large scale, at large scale, a copy of those physical models. So um, uh, 
uh, Fry Otto, for example, he used, or used hanging chain uh, networks, for example, to develop the shape for the Mannheim uh, grid shells, but he also developed techniques for pneumatics, so where he would inflate plastics and take that geometry. Um, Heinz Isler, he developed methods where he would put a fabric in polyester and let it hang, and then that would harden and he would turn it upside down, and that would be a shell form. And then he would he developed this really intricate um, machinery to kind of scan, but not really scan, like from that 3D model, get the geometry, and then even do his analysis on the, on the models. I'm not saying that we have to do that, um, but I think uh, developing shapes with your hands through these physical models is actually very useful. And then I think once you have that shape, then you can go on the computer and try to um, you know, model it a little bit more accurately. And so you can also get a sense of what are the stresses, et cetera, which you can't, cannot really get in a model. And so um, with my students, you know, I teach them how to um, do form finding for membrane structures. So we make uh, models um, with Lycra and, and we pre-tension them. I also teach them how to make, uh, how to do form finding for shell structures. So we do plaster hanging models. But I would even go like a step further because those are all still very small scale and you kind of manipulate them uh, with your hand. But what I've kind of come to learn over the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to work at a much larger scale. So um, I was at the University of uh, Washington where I was invited to do an architectural studio and um, we got a big donation of nets. So, we, the, so the studio was about making a net installation for dancers but not at the small scale, but at the real scale. So real, real structure, real weights, dancers are jumping in it. And so that was really an amazing experience because if you can work at the full scale and especially with something like knits, you know, that move immediately, that, you know, are so kind of responsive to loading, that's a really great uh, learning experience. I, for example, I learned, I remember one instance where we had, or the students had tied the net back and of course, there's a lot of tensile forces, so they had put like a big tree trunk there as a counterweight, and the dancers went on the net, and the tree trunk lifted. Oh. Yeah, and so then they had to go and stand on the tree trunk to kind of keep it down, and so that's an amazing, and I was also sitting on that tree trunk. It's an amazing experience to just feel the forces, as just the magnitude of these forces. Um, so that has been, a, yeah, I think if you can do things at the full scale or even, I did another course um, this fall together with a sculptor where uh, students were making what we call the sleeping platform, so a bed. And uh, the final exam was that they had to do a sleepover in that bed. So you have to really make something that's gonna carry your weight and not just kind of at the small model or the computational model where, you know, if you make a mistake, it doesn't really show. But if you make stuff and you load it with real loads, which can, which can just be your body load, uh, that is very insightful. And so we had, for example, one bed, which was a, a ring, which had like bend, uh, uh, lats on it, which were bent, but they were bent far too much. And so like they kept on breaking. And so we did some calculations with the student that eventually he reinforced it. And eventually he slept in that bed, right? And so I think um, the, it, like you can build up a lot of intuition by making things either with your hands, so you get a bit of sense of, wow, there's a lot of, force here or by making stuff at the full scale and getting a sense of how the forces are flowing and how they're pulling and pushing and bending and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it reminds me of one incident in my studio where I was designing a chair right. and conceptually it worked but right. then I had like actual loading on that chair yeah. and real scale yeah. then I realized it started bending so I, I had to add more braces to mm -hmm. make it work so yeah. there are some things which you can't like uh, imagine right. at your small scale model mm -hmm. but in real life when there are some things which you figure out yeah. while working on it exactly exactly and i think also sometimes at the small scale you can just glue everything together yeah. <laughs> to hold up right yeah. and you do it like this and it kind of holds up but then if you do the real scale with the real loads that's it and i think that's a very useful mm -hmm. um learning exercise besides the you know solving the equations and making that everything adds up to zero um yeah that's very very useful and i think those are also the experiences that students remember mm -hmm. like oh my god when that broke you know yeah. like that kind of stuff the american society for civil engineers has just well just has released a uh, kind of a vision of the future and so that's very exciting because um 
they are really thinking big time about how our cities, what they're going to look like. And I think there is the obvious kind of the smart cities, all the sensors and the wireless networks and the data collection and so then machine learning and artificial intelligence. That is going to change um, the way that we live in cities. Um, I think in terms of uh, materials and construction methods, I expect also, uh, and it's, it has already started, right? But I think the potential of uh, 3D printing and robotic construction is gonna not only, I think, allow us to uh, build in extreme environments, you know, build safely and maybe more cheaply um, in places where that's at the moment hard, um, but also it's gonna allow us to make, I think, structures that we couldn't really make before, which is exciting. And then I think also the 3D printing allows us to make materials that we couldn't really make before, or maybe um, print materials which either have you know, more than one material together, so like really in the chemistry, do things, but uh, also materials that, and, and they call that metamaterials, that not so much because of their chemistry, but because of the way that they are deposited, are exhibiting uh, specific properties. And that, that is very exciting because we have not been able to do that um, before. And actually, I think a lot of the um, work that maybe was theoretically developed before, now we can actually make it with these 3D printers. So I think that's very exciting. So we're gonna see, I think we're gonna see materials that um, have properties that before we could only um, wish for. Um, and I would like to see that um, adapted in the kind of construction industry. Uh, and that would really make a big uh, leap. But I think also if you look at the vision of the Society of um, Civil Engineers, you know, they're talking about um, floating cities. Wow, <laughs> that's exciting. <laughs> They're talking about uh, building on Mars, you know, which, which sounds futuristic, but which you know people are you know heavily involved in, at the moment, and they also talk about the frozen cities, so uh, building cities uh, on the Arctic. So okay, so this is still going to be buildings and bridges and whatever, but now we're under very different uh, conditions, very different loading conditions, um, very different materials. Um, so it's going to be a very exciting time, I think, for civil engineers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like it even ties back to your philosophy of Tripoli, e where like there would be more mm -hmm. efficient materials mm -hmm. with like three D printing. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I'm also interested with these new technologies. I hope that we will build structures that really express that tool, right? So I hope we're not going to use three D printing to do like uh, column and beam structures because we cannot really do that, right? But like I'm just very curious to see where. What is what is are these new technologies to all? What are they going to allow us that we, we're not really doing at the moment? Uh, that's very exciting. That's a difficult question. I think the the only thing. Well, I have advice for other people. I think the only advice which I'm slowly starting to accept the advice that my mother gave me to always get a good night's sleep. <laughs> but apart from that, I think uh, I have more for young for younger people. I have lots of <laughs> advice. Um, but I think if. Yeah, my advice would be to other people to be ready and to be creative because there's going to be so many challenges out there. So um, And to follow what you think you should be doing, uh, not what other people think you should be doing. That's my advice, I think. And to get a good night's sleep, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't change anything. I didn't listen to anybody. <laughs> I um, Actually, it's interesting when you say when you're 18 because... When I was 18, I didn't listen to anybody. So this is, of course, a long time ago, but um, I wanted to do something different. And so, you know, I grew up in Belgium. We have really good universities in Belgium, but I just wanted to go somewhere else. And so I went to study in England. Nobody did that at that time. And so, and I remember, you know, like friends of my parents telling my parents, oh, she shouldn't be doing this. She will never get a job, you know. and. Um, the one thing just kind of led to the other thing and I sometimes uh, say this to my parents remember you know I was not really supposed to go to England mm -hmm. but um, you know look at the journey that it's taken me on um, so I think you should follow um, what you yourself think you should be doing uh, people will always have opinions about what you should be doing and what they're doing um, yeah yeah, so like it was worth all the risk you have taken. Oh, definitely. And I didn't even know what what was going to come next, right? But I, I, I just felt that was the right thing. I mean, I've done 
uh, a lot of things that I shouldn't have done. <laughs> but I think in the end, they all really enriched me as a person and, and who I am now. And I think if you have um, experiences that other people don't have, it just makes you a different person and you can contribute in a very valuable way um, to the work, to society, to communities, etc. Uh, that's a good question because I have a blog. Um, uh, I don't actually know the name, but if you do the form finding and blog, you will find it. Or if you go, I have a web page, the form finding lab uh, web page. And we also have an Instagram account. So there's many ways uh, that you can follow me. But I think the blog is probably the most interesting one because it actually has small articles about um, matters that I find important or that I have participated in. Um, I don't know. And it's the blog is kind of a nice way for me to write down uh, my thoughts and share it with people. So mm. I think that's the best way to follow. Mm. Right. So I'm here today. Um, I'm going to give a talk at four uh, on uh, structures for an urban resilient environment. Uh, but the other, when I go back to Princeton, the things that are waiting for me is I'm involved, well, besides all the work of research and grants and all that, the things I'm excited about is um, I'm involved in a, an atelier course, which is together with, a, uh, with the choreographer Rebecca Lazier and the visual artist uh, Janet Echerman. And so we are making net installations as well as a choreogra uh, choreography. Uh, choreographic performance and also Ezoim is involved with that. So that's very exciting. We're going to have a performance on the 4th of May and the 29th of May. So that's very exciting. And the other thing I'm very excited about is um, we're also involved in a project uh, also with Ezoim and uh, Stefana Faraccio from the School of Architecture at Princeton University where we're looking at how to build shelves with robots. And that's going to be shown in London, I think, on the 17th of March at University of Westminster. So those are all short, exciting projects that are coming up. I'm always looking for interested, uh, creative, uh, smart people to work with me. So uh, I would say go and check out my blog. And if you think this is something you like to do, then contact me by email. And uh, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to hear from you.